We're here with Nate Simpson, the creator of Non-Player. Thanks a lot for meeting with us. Thanks a lot. So, I mean, Non-Player has sort of taken the world by storm here. Immediate sellout, immediate sellout on the second print run, right? It was. I don't think it's sold out yet on the second print run, so get to your local comic shop soon. So, you know, there, there, so what is non-player? What is it that, you know, everyone's clamoring for here? Well, I don't exactly know why it seems to be the quote-unquote buzz book. I have been hearing that from a lot of people. I think um, part of it is that the first print run was not particularly large, and uh, so we got to tell people that we sold out, and that sort of creates its own buzz, I guess. Right. Um, but uh, as to what it is about the flavor that people seem to like, I I'm, I'm not exactly sure. What, what is it? What do you think? Well, that's what I was going to ask. Is you, what, you know, give us a nutshell sort of breakdown of what non-player is. Sure. Uh, well, it takes place in a future. Uh, actually, half the comic takes place inside a massively multiplayer online game, mm -hmm. a fantasy game called Warriors of Jarvath. And then the other half it just follows the life of this girl who delivers tamales for a living, doesn't really have any prospects in the real world, but she's this elite assassin inside the game. Mm -hmm. And she ends up killing uh, a, uh, the wife of a celebrity game character, an AI-controlled game character, right around the time when the non-player characters are achieving sentience inside the game. So she ends up the target of this blood vendetta that may or may not spill out into the real world in future issues. And so... Is this something, I mean, are you a, a massive online role-playing game person, or is this just something where you sort of have captured onto the, the, the fandom of it all? Uh, well, actually, my wife works at a company that makes massively multiplayer games. Um, having worked in video games myself, I'm familiar with the genre. I, I have not been a habitual player. I did a few weeks of research on World of Warcraft and Ion. Research, right. Quote, unquote, <laughs> research. When it stopped feeling like research and started feeling like an addiction, I had to unplug because I do totally understand how a person can just disappear into a world like that. And that's part of what the comic's about. And so, you know, you've kind of come out of, you know, sort of nowhere as far as comic books are concerned. Um, what is your background in all this? Uh, I've been working in video games since 1993. Um, all PC games that you probably have not heard of. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, it was an opportunity, I guess, to sort of develop my art skills kind of on, on the down low. Mm -hmm. uh, mostly concept art, some modeling, that kind of stuff. And so why did you make the decision then to go into comics, then branching out from you know, video games? Sure. Well, I mean, I've always been uh, into comics. I've got a, a garage full of failed half comics <laughs> since I was a kid. Um, probably the, the, the proximate cause for me qu quitting my job and s trying this particular comic. Uh, I, somebody gave me as a gift a book of Miyazaki's storyboards for Nausicaa. Mm -hmm. And there was just something so pure about the expression. It was one guy and it was this world that he had thought of and it was so brilliantly executed. And then shot for shot turned into a film. Originally, I just wanted to make a film myself. That was my first plan when I quit. Eventually, that morphed into wanting to make a comic. So that's kind of how I ended up doing this. So now that this has, you know, like you said, it's been the buzz book. It's getting lots and lots of press. Are you looking at expanding it beyond this, uh, you know, this format? Are you offering? <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I'm certainly open to all options. Um, the comic... Uh, it is a six issue arc and it's a completely self-contained story it, it all does resolve itself in a satisfying way at the end of six yeah. issues um, there are certainly places for the story to go after six issues depending on how you know, how it's received um, and and yeah I would I would love you know one day to see it made into a movie but right now I'm just concentrating on the comic so six issues um what do you have in the pipeline after the six as, as far as you as a, as a creator goes? Uh, nothing set in stone. Um, I, I'll probably take a few weeks off and let my hand recover. Um, I do have another comic, actually, that I, I'm excited about starting in a, in a different format, possibly a manga format that's black and white, a little bit faster to get out. I'm, I really feel like I've been working really in the slowest possible mode, and I'm excited about finding a new style that'll let me get stuff out 
a little bit faster. All right. Well, let's go ahead and wrap this up the way that we wrap up all of our interviews by asking you, what's your issue? What is that comic that you've read that was so crazy, so wild, so out there that you just find yourself talking to other people about this comic? Uh, that's probably the first comic I've ever read, which was uh, the silent interlude issue of G.I. Joe. I don't know if you've seen, it, it, it's uh, Storm Shadow and Snake Eyes. Mm -hmm. It's like mano y mano, and there's no dialogue in the entire issue. I'm pretty sure, I mean, that, that was certainly the comic that made me think, oh my gosh, comics are, are something bigger than just, you know, pictures and words together. Because there were no words. Right. And, uh, and I think maybe that, that ethos even sort of infects the work I'm doing right now. I really try to keep the text to a minimum. There's no omniscient narrator. Uh, there's no thought bubbles. I really am trying to keep it as visual and cinematic as I can. So, yeah, that comic really pretty much set me on this course. Wonderful. All right, well, thank you very much for meeting with us, and all the best to you. Thanks a lot.